So do you guys ever remember how when you were like a kid and you had to walk around the house in the middle of the night with the lights off, it was freaking terrifying? And then you would stop to think about how weird it was that you were creeped out by your own house, so you would turn the lights on and suddenly it would turn into the most comfy place in the world? Gone Home is a game about that. The year is 1995 and you are a college-age girl. You just got home from a trip in Europe, but of course, home is a haunted house located somewhere in the woods outside of Twin Peaks. Naturally, it's a dark and stormy night outside and the place is mysteriously abandoned on the inside. So as these stories normally go, it's up to you to explore the house and find out what happened to everybody. You may or may not come to find a few surprises along the way. Gone Home was developed by the fine people who brought us the Minerva's Den DLC for Bioshock 2. Unfortunately, I haven't played it or its parent game, but the reviews seem to consistently claim that it was better than Bioshock 2 and that it also pushed up the quality of first-person environmental storytelling. And environmental storytelling is one of my favorite things that modern games love to do these days. I was like a kid in a candy shop while playing stuff like Bioshock in the new Fallout games, but I've always thought that the Puce Moose mod for New Vegas got this kind of storytelling so right. It rarely used combat and instead had you interact with and direct drive the plot via detective work puzzles. Dear Esther and Proteus came out shortly afterwards and ramped up the avant-garde qualities of this sort of thing up to a kind of disabling level. But now we have Gone Home. Compared to the other two, it's the voice of reason, but compared to the Bioshocks and the Fallouts, it's tasteful and classy. So I think that if you want to tell an involving and unique game story on a budget, then this is the interface to do it in. Environmental storytelling is like one of the video game equivalences of the show-don't-tell rule for movies. It's an effective interpretation of making a message out of mechanics, because rather than performing the message to the player, the player literally has to walk to, pick up, and examine the message themselves. In Gone Home, the whole game is just messages, and they're all over the place. There's no explicit goal, there's no combat, and there's no one else in this house. Just your own curiosity. And while that might sound all artsy and experimental on paper, when the game's in your hands it doesn't really feel like that. Believe it or not, the one game it reminded me the most of in terms of immersion and level design is the original Resident Evil. I guess what I'm trying to say is, is that there's enough interactivity here to avoid the annoying anti-game debate that follows the Proteuses and the Dear Esters. You have to do a healthy little bit of sleuthing to discover lock combinations and secrets and stuff, and since major story revelations are usually uncovered around the same time you unlock the next chunk of house, then exploration feels very rewarding. You're not just holding down the W key while passively receiving a barrage of audiovisual cues, you actually have to work for your story, and that makes all the difference in the world. So does the quality of the writing here, and the attention to detail, and even the choice of its setting. Gone Home takes place in 1995 for a lot of reasons. For starters, it lets them get away with telling this story through notes, voicemails, and letters without it feeling corny. This is a game about kids who pass notes to each other in class rather than text messages. It's about getting angry letters from your boss rather than emails, or reading reference books rather than googling all of your questions away. If you've ever looked through a pile of old invoices and realized just how much someone could learn about you personally from those very impersonal documents, then you might have an idea of how this game manages to pull it off. Setting it in the mid-90s also means that they can employ nostalgia and turn it into a time capsule. It's also about jutting down Chun-Li's movesets and headbanging to empowering feminist punk rock and Lisa Frank? Keep in mind that it does all this without any actual walking, talking characters showing up to give you an exposition dump. It tells as much story as possible with as few creative liberties as possible, so as a result, it gets creative with raw emotion by digging into the sappy memories of coming-of-age self-discovery. Considering that I'm not, nor was I ever, a college-age girl in 1995, this story actually hit me really hard. I was still able to connect to these characters, and that's a sign that the game succeeds at relating to the player as a normal human being rather than a super-powered space marine. And since the quality of its writing, pacing, and character development is all up to the task, then we have a powerfully emotional game about a comparatively mundane situation. That's not to say that it doesn't have its twists and turns. 
it does. And those twists and turns will surprise you. The way in which they surprise you will surprise you. And even the realization that they're surprising may surprise you. But I'm really kicking myself in the ass by making a day one, no spoilers, consumer advice review. Since the game came out within a couple hours of this video, I don't want to spoil anything this early in its life cycle. But since the game's so story driven, it's hard to clarify exactly how it works without spoiling something. I hate to be so vague, so I'd like to revisit it again for a future video, but in until then, all I can bring myself to say is that it simply does what it does very well. On the topic of conventional consumer advice reviews, I should probably also say that this game is only two hours long. It still looks like they haven't put the price on Steam, but RPS is reporting $20, which would mean that this game has a $10 per hour value that isn't exactly competitive with most other games. But that short length means that it's a very compressed story with the kind of little details in it that make you want to load it up again and say, oh at all the stuff that didn't make sense the first time. So there is some replay value to be garnered there, but during my first playthrough, I was at the edge of my seat for the entirety of both hours. I really got sucked in. For the second playthrough, I couldn't stop smiling the whole time. The tone had changed, everything made more sense, and I was noticing a whole bunch of enjoyable little extras that I missed the first time. Ten minutes into the game, I found myself actually laughing out loud, like really heavy, genuine laughs just from one little bit of clever writing. It was a clue that the game was heading in a great direction, and the uppers and the downers that followed that moment did not disappoint. All the little things that make this game unique add up to a game that's both great and unique. Even without considering the price tag, this game is written with so much sweetness and honesty that I fell in love with it. Those two hours will go by fast, but they'll have a lasting effect. If that price tag doesn't phase you, then go right ahead and pick this one up. I'd personally wait to see that price drop, but until then, the game's not gonna get any worse. It's the best bit of environmental storytelling I've played in years. 